This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Mysteries of Adolfo by Anne Radcliffe, Volume 2, Chapter 9, Part 1 of 2. The image of a wicked, heinous fault lives in his eye, that close aspect of his does show the mood of a much-troubled breast. King John Leaving the gay scenes of Paris, we return to those of the gloomy Apennine, where Emily's thoughts were still faithful to Valancourt. Looking to him as to her only hope, she recollected with jealous exactness every assurance and every proof she had witnessed of his affection, read again and again the letters she had received from him, weighed with intense anxiety the force of every word that spoke of his attachment, and dried her tears as she trusted in his truth. Montoni, meanwhile, had made strict inquiry concerning the strange circumstance of his alarm without obtaining information, and was at length obliged to account for it by the reasonable supposition that it was a mischievous trick played off by one of his domestics. His disagreements with Madame Montoni on the subject of her settlements were now more frequent than ever. He even confined her entirely to her own apartment, and did not scruple to threaten her with much greater severity, should she persevere in a refusal. Reason, had she consulted it, would now have perplexed her in the choice of conduct to be adopted. It would have pointed out the danger of irritating by further opposition a man such as Montoni had proved himself to be, and whose power she had so entirely committed herself, and it would also have told her of what extreme importance to her future comfort it was to reserve for herself those possessions which would enable her to live independently of Montoni, should she ever escape from his immediate control. But she was directed by a more decisive guide than reason, the spirit of revenge, which urged her to oppose violence to violence, and obstinacy to obstinacy. Wholly confined to the solitude of her apartment, she was now reduced to solicit the society she had lately rejected, for Emily was the only person except Annette with whom she was permitted to converse. Generously anxious for her peace, Emily therefore tried to persuade, when she could not convince, and sought by every gentle means to induce her to forbear that asperity of reply which so greatly irritated Montoni. The pride of her aunt did sometimes soften to the soothing voice of Emily, and there were even moments when she regarded her affectionate attentions with good will. The scenes of terrible contention, to which Emily was frequently compelled to be witness, exhausted her spirits more than any circumstance that had occurred since her departure from Thalus. The gentleness and goodness of her parents, together with the scenes of her early happiness, often stole on her mind like the visions of a higher world, while the characters and circumstances, now passing beneath her eye, excited both terror and surprise. She could scarcely have imagined that passions so fierce and so various as those which Montoni exhibited could have been concentrated in one individual. Yet what more surprised her was that on great occasions he could bend these passions, wild as they were, to the cause of his interest, and generally could disguise in his countenance their operation on his mind. But she had seen him too often, when he had thought it unnecessary to conceal his nature, to be deceived on such occasions. Her present life appeared like the dream of a distempered imagination, or like one of those frightful fictions in which the wild genius of poets sometimes delighted. Reflection brought only regret and anticipation terror. How often did she wish to steal the lark's wing and mount the swiftest gale that Languedoc and repose might once more be hers? Of Count Morano's health she made frequent inquiry but Annette heard only vague reports of his danger, and that his surgeon had said he would never leave the cottage alive. While Emily could not but be shocked to think that she, however innocently, might be the means of his death, and Annette, who did not fail to observe her emotion, 
interpreted it in her own way. But a circumstance soon occurred which entirely withdrew Annette's attention from the subject, and awakened the surprise and curiosity so natural to her. Coming one day to Emily's apartment, with a countenance full of importance, "'What can all this mean, Mademoiselle? said she. "'Would I was safe in Languedoc again. They should never catch me going on my travels any more. I must think it a fine thing, truly, to come abroad and see foreign parts.' I little thought I was coming to be catched up in an old castle among such dreary mountains, with the chance of being murdered, or what is as good having my throat cut. What can all this mean, indeed, Annette? said Emily, in astonishment. I, am so. You may look surprised, but you won't believe it, perhaps, till they have murdered you, too. You would not believe about the ghost I told you of, though I showed you the very place where it used to appear. "'You will believe nothing, mademoiselle. "'Not till you speak more reasonably, Annette. "'For heaven's sake, explain your meaning. "'You spoke of murder. "'I, mademoiselle, they are coming to murder us all. "'Perhaps but what signifies explaining? "'You will not believe.' "'Emily again desired her to relate what she had seen or heard. "'Oh, I have seen enough, ma'am, and heard too much, "'as Ludovico can prove. "'Poor soul, they will murder him, too.' I little thought when he sung those sweet verses under my lattice at Venice. Emily looked impatient and displeased. Well, mademoiselle, as I was saying, these preparations about the castle and these strange-looking people that are calling here every day and the signor's cruel usage of my lady and his odd goings-on, all these, as I told Ludovico, can bode no good. And he bid me hold my tongue. So, says I, the signor strangely altered. Ludovico in this gloomy castle, to what he was in France, they are all so gay. Nobody so gallant to my lady then, and he could smile, too, upon a poor servant sometimes, and jeer her, too, good-naturedly enough. I remember once, when he said to me, as I was going out of my lady's dressing-room, Annette, says he, never mind what the signor said, interrupted Emily, but tell me, at once, the circumstance which has thus alarmed you. I, mademoiselle, rejoined Annette. That is just what Ludovico said. Says he, never mind what the signor says to you. So I told him what I thought about the signor. He is so strangely altered, said I. For now he is so haughty, and so commanding, and so sharp with my lady. And if he meets one, he'll scarcely look at one, unless it be to frown. So much the better, says Ludovico, so much the better. And to tell you the truth, mademoiselle, I thought this was a very ill-natured speech of Ludovico, but I went on. And then, says I, he is always knitting his brows, and if one speaks to him, he does not hear. And then he sits up counselling so of a night with the other signors. There they are, till long past midnight, discoursing together. Ay, but, says Ludovico, you don't know what they are counselling about. No, said I, but I can guess. It is about my young lady. Upon that Ludovico burst out a-laughing, quite loud. So he put me in a huff, for I did not like that either I or you, mademoiselle, should be laughed at, and I turned away quick, but he stopped me. Don't be affronted, Annette, said he, but I cannot help laughing. And with that he laughed again. What, says he, do you think the signors sit up night after night only to counsel after thy young lady? No, no, there is something more in the wind than that. And these repairs about the castle, and these preparations about the ramparts, they are not making about young ladies. Why, surely, says I, the signor, my master, is not going to make war. Make war, says Ludovico? What upon the mountains and the woods? For here is no living soul to make war upon that I see. What are these preparations for, then, said I? Why, surely nobody is coming to take away my master's castle. Then there are so many ill-looking fellows coming to the castle every day, says Ludovico, without answering my question, and the signor sees them all, and talks with them all, and they all stay in the neighborhood. By holy St. Marco, some of them are the most cutthroat-looking dogs I ever set my eyes upon. I asked Ludovico again if he thought they were coming to take away my master's castle, and he said no. 
He did not think they were, but he did not know for certain. Then yesterday, said he, but you must not tell this, mademoiselle, yesterday a party of these men came and left all their horses in the castle stables, where it seems they are to stay, for the seigneur ordered them all to be entertained with the best provender in the manger. But the men are, most of them, in the neighboring cottages. So, mademoiselle, I came to tell you all this, for I never heard anything so strange in my life. But what can all these ill-looking men be about, if it is not to murder us? And the seigneur knows this, or why should he be so civil to them? And why should he fortify the castle and counsel so much with the other seigneurs, and be so thoughtful? Is this all you have to tell, Annette? said Emily. Have you heard nothing else that alarms you? Nothing else, mademoiselle, said Annette. Why, is not this enough? Quite enough for my patience, Annette, but not quite enough to convince me we are all to be murdered, though I acknowledge here is sufficient food for curiosity. She forbore to speak her apprehensions, because she would not encourage Annette's wild terrors, but the present circumstances of the castle both surprised and alarmed her. Annette, having told her tale, left the chamber on the wing for new wonders. In the evening Emily had passed some melancholy hours with Madame Montoni, and was retiring to rest when she was alarmed by a strange and loud knocking at her chamber door, and then a heavy weight fell against it that almost burst it open. She called to know who was there, and receiving no answer, repeated the call, but a chilling silence followed. It occurred to her, for at this moment she could not reason on the probability of circumstances, that some one of the strangers lately arrived at the castle had discovered her apartment, and was come with such intent as her looks rendered too possible to rob, perhaps to murder her. The moment she admitted this possibility, terror supplied the place of conviction, and a kind of instinctive remembrance of her remote situation from the family heightened it to a degree that almost overcame her senses. She looked at the door which led to the staircase, expecting to see it open, and, listening in fearful silence for a return of the noise, till she began to think it had proceeded from the door, and a wish of escaping through the opposite one rushed upon her mind. She went to the gallery door, and then, fearing to open it, lest some person might be silently lurking for her without, she stopped, but with her eyes fixed in expectation upon the opposite door of the staircase. As thus she stood, she heard a faint breathing near her, and became convinced that some person was on the other side of the door, which was already locked. She sought for other fastening, but there was none. While she yet listened, the breathing was distinctly heard, and her terror was not soothed when, looking round her wide and lonely chamber, she again considered her remote situation. As she stood hesitating whether to call for assistance, the continuance of the stillness surprised her, and her spirits would have revived had she not continued to hear the faint breathing that convinced her the person, whoever it was, had not quitted the door. At length, Worn out with anxiety, she determined to call loudly for assistance from her casement, and was advancing to it when, whether the terror of her mind gave her ideal sounds, or that real ones did come, she thought footsteps were ascending the private staircase, and expecting to see its door unclosed, she forgot all other cause of alarm, and retreated towards the corridor. Here she endeavored to make her escape, but on opening the door, was very near falling over a person who lay on the floor without. She screamed, and would have passed, but her trembling frame refused to support her. And the moment in which she leaned against the wall of the gallery allowed her leisure to observe the figure before her and to recognize the features of Annette. Fear instantly yielded to surprise. She spoke in vain to the poor girl, who remained senseless on the floor, and then, losing all consciousness of her own weakness, hurried to her assistance. When Annette recovered, she was helped by Emily into the chamber, but was still unable to speak, and looked round her as if her eyes followed some person in the room. Emily tried to soothe her disturbed spirits, and forbear at present to ask her any questions, 
but the faculty of speech was never long withheld from Annette, and she explained in broken sentences and in her tedious way the occasion of her disorder. She affirmed, and with a solemnity of conviction that almost staggered the incredulity of Emily, that she had seen an apparition as she was passing to her bedroom through the corridor. I had heard strange stories of that chamber before, said Annette, but as it was so near yours, Mademoiselle, I would not tell them to you, because they would frighten you. The servants had told me often and often that it was haunted, and that was the reason why it was shut up, nay, for that matter, why the whole string of these rooms here are shut up. I quaked whenever I went by, and I must say I did sometimes think I heard odd noises within it. But as I said, as I was passing along the corridor, and not thinking a word about the matter, or even of the strange voice that the signors heard the other night, all of a sudden comes a great light, and looking behind me, there was a tall figure. I saw it as plainly, mademoiselle, as I see you at this moment, a tall figure gliding along. Oh, I cannot describe how, into the room that is always shut up, and nobody has the key of it but the signor and the door shut directly. Then it doubtless was the signor, said Emily. Oh, no, mademoiselle, it could not be him, for I left him busy a quarrelling in my lady's dressing room. You bring me strange tales, Annette, said Emily. It was but this morning that you would have terrified me with the apprehension of murder, and now you would persuade me you have seen a ghost. These wonderful stories come too quickly. Nay, mademoiselle, I will say no more, only, if I had not been frightened, I should not have fainted dead away. So I ran as fast as I could to get to your door, but what was the worst of all, I could not call out. Then I thought something must be strangely the matter with me, and directly I dropped down. Was it the chamber where the black veil hangs? said Emily. Oh, no, mademoiselle. It was one nearer to this. What shall I do to get to my room? I would not go out into the corridor again for the whole world. Emily, whose spirits had been severely shocked, and who, therefore, did not like the thought of passing the night alone, told her she might sleep where she was. Oh, no, mademoiselle, replied Annette. I would not sleep in the room now for a thousand sequins. Worried and disappointed, Emily first ridiculed, though she shared her fears, and then tried to soothe them, but neither attempt succeeded, and the girl persisted in believing and affirming that what she had seen was nothing human. It was not till some time after Emily had recovered her composure that she recollected the steps she had heard on the staircase, a remembrance, however, which made her insist that Annette should pass the night with her, and with much difficulty she at length prevailed assisted by that part of the girl's fear which concerned the corridor. End of Volume 2, Chapter 9, Part 1 of 2